Okay, everybody, uh, here we go. Um, yeah, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, uh, any difficulties, problems, um, good things, bad things? <laughs> Hope uh, life is going well for everybody. Uh, just a reminder, we won't have class next week. Um, it's our spring break already. It's so weird because Columbia started early and here, good Lord, it's just like, wow, time is flying by. Um, so here's what I am going to give you an assignment for over spring break. Um, when we come back, Nina is going to be presenting her project. Um, but she says she definitely won't take the whole time. She probably will. But <laughs> it's a really cool project. Uh, but I would do want to set aside some time and I want to talk about um, your projects, you know, ideas that you have, things that you'd like to do. So I'll be sending this out uh, on email for people who are you know, not here right now, just so everybody's aware. Uh, that way we'll have kind of it set. And it, I'll be honest, there's there's not a whole lot more I'm going to show you in this class. So we'll be able to work on projects and, you know, answer questions and things like that. Uh, we have a couple of guests coming in besides Nina. Um, uh, Lara Lewison is going to be talking about her work on the on the web. And uh, then Ethan Edwards is going to be talking about his work, work in general, which is pretty impressive. They're both really impressive. Um, and I will be doing one more Unity class, but it will be Unity on the web. And that's basically not really new stuff. It's just showing how you take a project and you compile it and then can run it from a web page. Because um, that seems to be a thing that people are getting a kick out of doing. Okay. Uh, what I want to do tonight is I want to finish up. I said we're not going to do much Unity uh, tonight, but we are. Just, just the very beginning. I want to do one more sort of thing with movies. And I wanna actually go through that process of bringing the movie in because it's very straightforward and I kind of screwed it up a little bit last time. Uh, but I wanna show you how to do some, some clever tricks with it. It's not extensive at all. And we'll be looking at a little bit of code, but then after that, we're just gonna be doing some, a lot of sound. And as I promised, uh, we'll be doing it in PD um, because uh, you know a lot of people are working with PD because of the RTC mix tilde problems on Macintoshes, which I hope we can solve over the, uh, uh, the holiday break or the uh, spring break. But um, what I'm going to do with Unity is I'm going to talk about, I'm also using these things as an excuse to talk about stuff, like some of the RTC Mix things I'm going to show you tonight also demonstrates aspects of RTC Mix that we haven't really covered. Um, let me stop my share here and let me start my share again. Okay. Hang on a minute. Share screen. Come on, there we go. Share computer sound too. Share, okay. And I don't know if anybody noticed on the video, some people wrote me who hadn't seen it, but I had repositioned, you can't see it, but I repositioned the faces and it wound up occluding a lot of what I was trying to show on the screen. So I'm gonna be careful about not doing that tonight. Okay, I hope. Um, I just made everybody go away. All right. So, right. I can't see you, Nina. Let me know if people have questions or just shout them out. You guys can all hear me okay, right? I assume. Is that? Uh... Everything is. Okay. Good, good, good. Yeah. Good, good, good. Okay. Let me, I'm going to start up a project and we're going to kind of build it from scratch because it's not going to be particularly uh, intense or anything like that. So let me say new. Okay. And we're going to go here to let's see if i'm in the right directory class stuff okay right we're going to create that directory or we're going to use that directory i'm going to call this class water fade spell okay and what you're probably getting a sense of from the name what it's going to be. Um, you know, we talked about bringing in videos. What if you wanted to have a video that faded in? Okay, so it didn't just like start, you know, that's something that might be kind of fun to sneak in. And I want to use that as an excuse to also talk about timing in Unity and what's involved in, in, in working with time. Okay, so here we are, we got our basic Unity project. All right. And the first thing I'm going to do, I want to, um, let me bring up a, a, a kind of a text thing here just to show you, okay, the two different things that we need to learn about with timing with Unity, okay, is there's this object called time, okay, 
And I'm going to kind of show you that in a little bit too. Okay. And time has certain members to it. Um, what, the two that we're going to be looking at most closely is time dot time. That is a number. And you can say things like, like, you know, a equals time dot time. Okay. Um, what time dot time is, it's the number of seconds that have run since the starting of your project. So that's a way of keeping track of the absolute time. So if you want to have something that occurs 40 seconds into the, the start of your VR world or something, you're going to be checking that variable to see what it is. The other one is a little bit more complicated. It's time.delta time. Okay. And time.delta time is the amount of time since the last frame. So typically it's like 1 60th of a second. All right. And the thing that's really useful for that is that you can have a, a variable. Okay. We can say something like this float um, cur time. And we can initially set it to 0, 0.0, something like that. Okay. And we can say in our, say our update method. Okay. Um, we can say something like um, cur time equals cur time plus time dot time. Okay, why would we want to do that? Well, because we know that this is going to track the time. And if we want to have something occur, say, every one second, we can always check here and we can say if cur time equals 1.0 f, then we can set it back to zero. Okay, because it'll constantly get up. Yeah, question. Somebody say something? Is it time dot time or time dot delta time? Oh, delta time, thank you. Yes, I'm getting, oh, this is starting out already. <laughs> right, time dot delta time, yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, so this will basically then go up to one and when it each hits one second, it'll reset over and over and over again. But we can be more clear about this. We can say things like time dot delta time. And we could say if we wanted to divide by 2.0 F. Okay. And we're adding half as much each time. So that basically when this reaches one, it will actually have gone for two seconds. That's one way to think about it. Okay. And that's actually a way we're going to use tonight. You could have just said if cur time equals 2.0 F and done that, you know, well, whatever, I'm screwing it up now. Um, but, uh, but this is going to be kind of uh, useful for, for our fading situation. Okay. So let me go ahead and um, let's get our, let's get our screen and stuff going. Okay. I'm going to quit this and you're going to see how we're going to use this in a second. Okay. Uh, don't save, we'll delete that. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a cube. It's going to be our screen, okay? All right, here we go. All right, and let's reset it to zero over here. Reset. All right. Hey, I'm recording this this screen, right? Yes. Okay. I I can't see the recordings thing for some reason, and I got freaked out that I wasn't recording, it's but I guess. I'm, okay. Whew, yay. Okay. So there we go. Okay. Let's uh let's kind of flip it around a little bit. So we got our X axis going that way. And just for fun, like I said, I like to move my camera in a little bit closer. Minus five, not minus, minus five. Minus five right about there, okay? And let's take this cube and let's flatten it out 0 0.1, okay? Oops, I just did that to the camera. That was stupid of me, okay? 0 0.1, okay, let's make the X dimension be maybe three and the Y dimension be maybe five. Okay, so we've got a nice screen in front of us. Okay, uh, maybe we'll move our camera back just a little bit so that we can see the screen. Minus seven. Yeah, there we go. Uh, maybe move the camera down a little bit. Okay, so we've got a nice screen in front of us, you know, looking very screen-like, okay? And what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna add to that screen now, I want to use this as an, an opportunity already to kind of like talk about something. Um, there's two different ways of getting a video player in. One is to go up here to video, and you can say video player. But a lot of these things that are here, 
you can also add as a component to something. So I can actually put the video player right on the cube. And in fact, that's what I'm going to do, okay? Um, because it's going to be useful to have it just directly on our screen in a little bit. So we can go down here to video and then click video player and it will add it. Let's close up these guys so we can see everything. Okay. So there's all the stuff that we need to know about the video player. Okay. Um, now we're going to make sure that this is going to be going to our camera. So we're going to take the main camera, drag that over here and put it on our, where, where did our camera go? Uh, I guess I don't need to do that when it's a, yeah, when it's a, hmm. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, dang, I'm screwing up already, guys. Okay. Ah, right. When we go to camera far plane. Okay, uh, that's right. We need to do that. Okay, I need to tell the video player where to render to. And I'm just going to, we don't actually, we're going we're gonna to render it actually to a screen. But just for fun, I'm going to make sure that we have this camera in place. Okay, I'm not sure if it's necessary or not. All righty. Um, and now let's... Uh, Let's create a render texture. This is what I messed up last time because I added the texture twice um, and I kind of inadvertently created it just by dragging the video clip onto it. But I want to create the render texture explicitly first, okay? So let's go here and we will go to create and go down here to render texture, okay? And call this our render text, okay? All right. And now we're going to go back to our cube and we're going to have our camera our video player render to that render texture. Okay. And we're going to take this and we're going to, we can just select it here and then go rend text there. That's the same thing as dragging it over there. Okay. So we'll do that. Life is good. Now the video camera is playing to that render texture and we're going to take that render texture and put it onto our cube. And it automatically creates a new material for us. Okay, down in this sort of, it created a whole separate um, uh, folder for us in our assets. Okay, all right. Now, what we're going to do now is we're going to bring in a video clip. Okay, and let me find this video clip. I believe. Would you go have... back one second? What's that? Question? Can you go back one second. Sure. Where to? Uh, the when you added the rend text onto the cube. Yeah. I can't find the target texture thing. Oh, okay. Go to um, the cube and on the video player down here under render mode. Hit render texture there. Do you see it? Okay, and then I can either drag the render texture over to that, or I was showing a different way to do it. See these little dots here that Unity has? If you select the dots, it gives you all the possible render textures that you can have. And ours was just there as rend text, so I just selected that and then closed it off. So it's two ways of accomplishing the same thing. Unity often has multiple ways of doing the same thing. Okay. Okay, got it. All right, cool. All righty, uh, let's see, let me see here. Create, okay, drag render texture, create a new material, select the render texture, okay, all right, and there, right, okay. Now, let's uh, go out and find our video that we want, okay, and I happen to have it down in here, okay, uh, I believe, yeah, water four, and I'm going to take that, I'm going to drag it into this, okay, and what water four is, is basically... It's a video I took from the ferry out here on Whidbey Island of the water going by, okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to loop that in a way that we're going to be able to kind of like make it seamless and kind of create like a, a passageway that's just going to have that going all the time. It's only 10 seconds long, okay? But that's going to be okay for us, okay? Um, so what we need to do is go to our material. Oh, no, 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 not to our material. Um, we're going to make our video player, okay, basically, we're going to take that water 
move it up to our video clip because that's what we want the video player to play. Okay. And again, I can click and drag it up there or I can do what I did before. I can hit the little button here and then select water there. Okay. Either way, as long as it says water there, we're now set and the video player will play. In fact, we can check this now. We can actually play it and it will simply play that clip onto the screen. Let's try it out. Okay. Yep, there it is. Okay. Now, notice that it has some bars above and below it. Okay. What I can do is go back here uh, to, I believe it's the texture. And I can change the size of the texture. Let me just goose it up here like this. Okay. And I'm not paying any attention to the actual size of the video clip. I'm just saying, all right, let's make this texture be 512 by 256. And now if we play it, it'll like squeeze it all into that, um, into that, uh, uh, the screen. Okay, here we go. There we go. I was happy. Now it turns out it's upside down, but uh, that's okay because uh, it doesn't really matter for my purposes. I just wanted to have that kind of thing kind of flipping in the background. All right. Now, we're going to set it so that it can fade up and fade down, okay? And the first thing we have to do is modify this um, material that it's, a, that, it's, that it's rendering to, this render texture material, okay? Notice that our rendering mode is opaque, okay? And that allows us to do things like change the color of it, okay? Um, but we don't want to change the color. We want to change what's called the alpha value. Some of you guys already know about this, but when you're specifying color, generally we talk about RGB, the red component, the blue component, the green component. You mix them together, you get different colors. But there's also this thing called the alpha component. And this controls the transparency of the color that we're making. Now, notice that as I move this, if I move this one, it changes the color. Yay! If I move the transparency, it doesn't do anything. That's because our rendering mode has been set to opaque. So it's ignoring that alpha. If we set it to fade, watch what happens now. Okay. I can go back here to this little color thing. And if I move the alpha, ooh, it fades out and fades up. And again, just to reinforce what I've said before, everything that's over here, you can also script because these are just sort of entry points onto variables. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to script that fading in and fading out. So let's go here and let's open up a new script on our cube that has our video player, that has our texture and all the good stuff that we need all in one nice place. We'll add a component, go down here to a new script, and we'll call this the fade script. Okay. There we go. All right, and we're gonna now double click on that and get our Visual Studio up and running. And now I, I have to face a decision. Um, do I type this in and you guys can see it happen live or do you wanna, I've, I've already got this pre-made. What's, what's your preference? Just kind of shout some things out. You want to see me do like the slow typing thing or what do you typing. feel like? Yeah, type. You want to see, okay, I'll create it from scratch. Oh, that's going to be exciting. Fortunately, I already have it like written out for me on my little tablet here. So, you know, unless I completely mistype the names, it should be okay. All right, let's see what we're going to do. Okay, so we've got all this, okay. Now, because we're going to be altering the video playback, we're also going to have to add using, okay, uh, uh, Unity Engine. dot video. I really like this um, uh, Visual Studio thing of completing all the stuff. It, it, it really makes me lazy in a really nice way. Okay, so we're going to declare some variables right off the top that we'll be using through this. We're going to declare a variable that will refer to the video player. Oh, so video player. Okay, and that's we'll just call it V player. Okay. We're going to have a script. We're going to have an, an element we're going to call playtime. 
which is going to hold how much time we've played it. So we know when we've achieved a certain level of fading up and we can, you know, alter it from there. Then we're going to have a thing called flipper, okay? And what flipper is going to do is going to basically allow us to go from fading up to fading down. And somehow I got something weird there. Okay. All right. Oh, it's just on my screen. Okay. And then we've got to add a few other things that we're going to need to have access to. We're going to have to have access to our renderer because that's the thing that's rendering the video onto the material, which is then on the screen. Okay. And we'll just call that rend. Okay. And we're going to have access to our alpha variable that I just talked about, which is going to be the thing that we can use to fade stuff up and down. Okay. So, uh, we're going to start out, okay, and we're going to have a private, I could do this in the start thing, but I'm going to do it in my awake thing, void awake, okay, Oops. awake, okay, and we're going to say, first of all, we're going to get our video component, we're going to say vplayer equals get component. video player. There's our video player. There we go. Okay. All right. And when we just say get component without anything else in front of it, it will get the component from the current object. And that's why I put the video player on this cube object. So we can just grab it from there. Otherwise we'd have to look for it, but it's not a big deal. We'd have to say game object dot find, you know, video player and all that nonsense. Okay. Okay. And we can do the same thing for rend. Okay. Rend equals, gosh, I'm having fun typing. You guys just get a kick out of laughing at me when I do this, don't you? Okay. Get component and we're going to get the renderer. There we go. Okay. And just so you know, ah, uh, Okay, just so you know, if we go out here to Unity and we look at our cube, okay, uh, and we look at our cube, the, there is a renderer there. That's the renderer, and we're getting that component because that's the thing that we're going to want to address um, in terms of fading our material up and down, okay? Uh, let me get back our... Visual Studio stuff. So we got those guys. Okay. Now we have to set up some stuff and start. Okay. First of all, we're going to say playtime is going to be equal to 0, 0.0 F. Okay. And we're going to say that our flipper is initially set to one. Okay. okay. And we're also going to initially set our alpha value to zero. Okay. All these colors and alphas generally work on a zero to one scale um, inside Unity. Zero means the alpha is completely gone, so it's completely transparent. That's how we're going to start the thing, okay? All right, and then we're going to say, okay, rend.material.color, uh, wait, I think, dot color, ah, equals new color, okay, and we're going to say one point, it's going to be full red, green, blue, okay, and alpha, okay. Now, how did I know about some of this stuff? Well, I looked it up on the web for one thing, but again, you can do that cute thing where you can highlight it and hit command um, single quote, and I think it's control single quote on Windows machines, and it will bring up this wonderful color thing. And it tells you all the stuff that, that color can do, all the properties, all the constructors, which we just used, constructs a new color with the given RGBA components. We can say, oh yeah, oh look, there's how you use it. Look, public color equals new color. Oh look, it's all right there for us. Um, I wanted to also point out that, like I said, over there, you've got the kind of Unity editor version of stuff. If you switch to manual, it will show you general things about like particle systems and the overview of how everything works. 
if you script switch to the scripting API, that's when it tells you stuff like the color sort of ins and outs of using the scripting. So I just wanted to also point out that that's there for you to, to kind of take advantage of too, you know, when you're looking at the documentation. Okay. So basically we set up everything that we want to do here. Okay. We've set our color. Okay. Uh, to have that alpha of zero, we set our flipper to when our playtime is zero. So when it starts, it's going to start at zero. Now the action for graphics, we're not going to do any sound with this. The action for graphics sound is in that, you know, on audio, uh, filter callback or whatever it's called um uh graphics all happen in this update method okay and here's what we're going to do here okay we're going to say if i can get this up here ready we're going to say if playtime that's our variable that's holding where we are okay is greater than or equal to 1.0 f okay we're going to do something or playtime is less than 0.0 f all right so basically if it's going to go beyond one or if it's going to be less than zero we're going to we're going to do something okay what's that something we're going to do okay that's something we're going to do is change the sign of flipper so flipper is going to dictate if we're going to be going in a positive direction or a negative direction now Here's where we're aiming with this, okay? Playtime is gonna go between zero up to one, then back to zero again, then back up to one. And we're gonna use that as our alpha component. That'll fade this up, fade it down, fade it up and fade it down. That's, that's exactly what we wanna have happen, okay? So here's what we do, okay? If flipper, Uh, sorry, if it's flipper greater than zero, okay, that means it's going in a positive direction, okay? We're going to say playtime equals, oh, I'm going to do something clever here, plus equals, okay? Time dot delta time divided by 5.0f, okay? Plus equals is the same thing as saying playtime equals playtime plus. You know, I just wanted to show that to you guys because that's a shorthand that's used a lot um, because this is so common to take something and then increment it by something. So we're basically just adding time dot delta time to playtime when flipper is positive, okay? Now, this means that playtime is gonna go from zero to one because time dot delta time is gonna go clear up to five before that collapses to one. That's why I showed you how we could do that division thing, okay? Uh, again, this is gonna be out on the web. You can look at it and kind of figure out the math, but it's pretty straightforward. This keeps adding, this keeps adding, this keeps adding, and each time you're adding, um, you know, one fifth of the time from the last frame. So when it finally hits one second, yeah, well, yeah, it'll take it to be five seconds, okay? So basically, that's gonna take play time and go from zero to one, okay? Else, we're going to say playtime minus time dot delta time divided by 5.0 f. Okay, so that's going to send it back down in the negative direction. And up here is where we check to see if it's already gone below zero or gone above one. So now playtime has kind of where we are in this kind of like fading up and fading down thing. So now we can say alpha. It's a little redundant here, equals playtime. And then we do this thing again. Create a new color for our material. Um, you could just create colors willy-nilly. I mean, uh, Unity is rather wasteful sometimes. They have a good garbage collector, which gets rid of all this stuff, okay? So basically, it will then create a new cover with whatever value is currently playtime. So as playtime goes from zero to one, this color is going to go from an alpha of zero to an alpha of one. That'll fade it up and fade it down. We're done. That's all there is to it, okay? Let's go out and watch what happens when I play this. Here we go. Ready? So we start out. Here's our game down here. Play, 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 play. There it goes. Fades up. Fades down. Five seconds. Fades.
shades up. Well, here's what we need to do. We need to loop it, okay? And the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off the audio output because I don't really want to hear the sound, okay? So I'm going to say none there. Now we can fade it up. And fade it down. There's five seconds. That's why I made the loop 10 seconds long because it fades up for five, fades down for five. Here it comes again. Fades up. Uh, yeah, there it goes. See, fading up. Yay. <laughs> okay. Now, here's what I'm not going to do, but I'll put it in the project on the web. What you can do is duplicate that object. All right. And again, you'll have to rename the script, but you're going to put in a check where the duplicate object won't start doing the fade up and fade stuff, fade down stuff, until five seconds after the, the beginning of the game. We can check it with time.time, .time, because time.time .time will tell us when we've gone five seconds. Then we'll fade that one up. And if you put the two directly on top of each other, we're going to do the same thing we did with extending the ambient sounds in RTC Mix. As one is fading down, the other will fade up. As that one fades down, the other will fade up. And you're going to get the impression of this thing that just kind of sits there and kind of wibbles like that. So fun things you can do with video in Unity. All righty. Um, so I'm going to quit Unity now. And we're going to start working with some RTC mix fun. OK? I uh, have a question. Sure. Fire away, Nina. Yeah. Um, are are we going to talk about how to do it with sound in RTC Mix? Uh, it's in it's in last two two classes ago. It was a it was that mix thing where I had it fade up and fade down. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, I can find it. I think. So it will be just okay to copy that. Um. Yeah code and somehow time it with the video for example if we want to synchronize the fade out of the video with the fade out of sound yes yes and in fact you can do it in the same script because mm -hmm. you can just add the sound stuff you know you can add the rtc mix stuff and the on audio filter whatever um you know you can actually do it right there and you control exactly when the sound is going to fade out and when the uh the, the video is going to fade out. Yeah. One thing I didn't show you that's part of the scripting interface is that you can actually control all the aspects of the video player. You can say when to start playing the video. You know, you can say when to stop playing the video. So you can be very tightly synchronized between the two. So yeah. we can also um, disable audio on the video and yeah. add whatever we want with RTC Mix. Exactly. exactly. Or you can actually take the audio and you send it to an audio source and you can then process it in RTC mix too, if you want to. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. But that, that's, that's too much to cover right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. We'll uh, get to that later if we need to. Okay. Uh, let me quit unity again. I'll put this, I'll put a version of this up that has uh, both objects there fading up and fading down. So when you download the package, it'll be there. Okay. But uh, let me quit. All right. And here we go. And we don't need Visual Studio anymore. So we'll quit that. All right. And here we go. All right. Um, yeah, we're, uh, we're, what I'm going to do now is I want to just walk you through. We'll see how far we get. Um, I may continue this um, after Nina's talk. I want to make sure we talk about projects um, after the break, but the following one, when I'm going to be talking about making our uh, Unity work on the web, that's not going to be that difficult because it's actually surprisingly easy. So if we run out of time, um, I want to continue with the audio stuff. Basically, I want to show you some tricks that I've learned through the years for making things kind of sound good, okay? Um, and give you some kind of pointers along the way. And again, I'm going to, I'm going to try and do it all in PD tonight. Okay. Because, uh, a lot of you are using PD and I just wanted to kind of get to know it myself. And it's actually surprisingly good. You know, it, it works pretty well with stuff. Okay. Um, let me, the first thing I want to talk about is I use this a lot, um, is what you would call constrained randomness. 
And, you know, we've already used randomness a lot, you know, in different kind of goofy little granular things that we've made and stuff like that. But you can really unlock a lot of power if you use randomness within certain constraints, almost as like a probability field or, you know, controlling, you know, timing and allowing a bit of wiggle room and stuff. And the first thing I want to do is create like a cool drone. Okay. So let me go here. All right. And I'm going to start up my PD patch here. Now I'm going to do um, one thing differently from what you might do with PD. Okay. Um, Okay, here comes our patch. I discovered something cool, okay? That's gonna be way too small for you guys to see, I think, but I can actually do this and it gets nice and big, okay? So, but the thing that it doesn't do is if I click on the RTC mix object to edit the script, the script is very, very tiny, okay? And in fact, this editor thing, isn't really that great, okay? Um, what I'm gonna do instead is use an external editor, and this is also very useful in Windows too. And I'm gonna save all my files in the same directory where this was, and then I'm just gonna hit the load button every time I wanna reload the file, okay? Uh, so let me start up text edit, because it's a nice plain editor, and I can also make it nice and big, okay? And let me now save this, okay? And I will put it into doo -doo -doo -doo, uh, soft spring week seven class stuff. Okay. And we'll just call this um, generic RTC mix stuff. Okay. RTC mix stuff dot text. Okay. All right. Now, uh, I have already made a bunch of these scripts so that when I put it on the web, I will put everything we're doing tonight will be a separate script that you'll be able to load into PD, okay? But here's what I wanna do, okay? I wanna create, first of all, a nice drone. And I'm gonna make this drone have a base frequency, okay? And that's gonna be, we'll, we'll, we'll make it nice and low. We're gonna make it 50 Hertz, okay? Let's make this a little bit bigger even, okay? And then I, I always like to have my amplitude envelope fading up and fading down. Okay, so I'll say amp end equals make table. Okay, line. Okay, a thousand points of light here. Time zero be zero at arbitrary time nine. At, at, at time one be one. At arbitrary time nine be one. At arbitrary time 10 be zero. So that'll make it just go up, hang out at one for like 80% of the note down for the last 10%, okay? And we'll say amp is gonna be equal to 10,000, okay? And now I'm gonna create a waveform because I don't wanna just assign wave because that's not as cool as like a, a, a better waveform, <laughs> not better. Um, but I'm gonna say make table. That make table is used for a lot of stuff, okay? This time we're not gonna create a line, we're gonna create a wave, meaning a waveform, and I'm gonna make it be a sawtooth waveform so this would be nice and buzzy yeah sawtooth yeah okay and now here's the fun thing okay i'm going to start this out okay i'm going to say wavetable okay start at time zero go for oh we'll say about ah, 10 seconds we'll mirror what this is doing up here even though we don't have to okay uh we're going to do it at a amp times amp end is going to be our amplitude that'll take that 10,000. Oh, let's make it 20,000 here, okay? All right, amp times amp end, and we're going to use our base frequency, and we're going to put it right in the middle, 0 0.5. That's our panning value. Again, I have wavetable pretty much memorized, so I know all that. Start, duration, amplitude, frequency, pan value between 0 and 1, and then finally, the waveform, okay? And we're gonna to listen to this, okay? So let me save that. Then I go out here. This is the fun way to work with PD. You say load, and there is our rtcmixstuff.test. We'll simply say open, and now we'll turn on our audio, and we'll hear that nice, oh, actually, I have to do one more thing. I have to go to my audio preferences and make sure that rtcmix is talking to the Zoom audio device. <laughs> I almost forgot about that. Okay, now, I'm gonna turn this on. 
And be careful, this might be a little loud, okay? Okay, did you all hear that? Okay, yeah, nice, low, buzzy, which is okay, but it's not that cool, okay? I like things that have a bit more animation to it, especially long, low drones that kind of like do stuff, okay? Um, I'm just like a drony kind of guy, all right? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to say four, we're lazy. Zero, i is less than three, i, and we'll say plus equals one instead of i equals i plus one because, you know, I'm lazy there too, all right? And I'm going to take this. And we're going to do something different here, okay? We're going to say that this is not base freak anymore. This is going to be freak, okay? And we're going to say freak equals uh, base freak plus I rand something, comma, something. Okay? What's going on here? Basically, I'm using the old Moog system for creating cool, thick sounds. Rather than just one wavetable or one oscillator, I've got three going. All right? And each one, because the old Moogs, you couldn't tune the oscillators directly to each other in the old analog days. We have to mimic that by injecting randomness into our frequency. All right? So how much randomness? Well, let's start out with, um, say three hertz below our base frequency and three hertz above our base frequency. So basically we're going to have three oscillators, but each one isn't going to be 50. It's going to be kind of somewhere between 47 and 53 hertz. Let's hear what that sounds like, okay? So I save that, hit load, reload this guy, turn on our DSP and we hear... Which is kind of cool, but maybe a little bit sort of out of control, okay? Um, here's what's fun. This constrained randomness stuff, you fool with it. I like this sound a lot better. Load this up. Turn on our DSP. And... That's a cool drone, you know? So again, and the fun thing is that if I put a, a recirculating bang on this or something, each time it fired off, it would be slightly different. So you'd get this really interesting mix of oscillators kind of drifting around and stuff like that. I'll leave that as an exercise for you guys to try, okay? All right, so fun as that is, it's still a little static for my taste, you know. I like that kind of like, you know, movement in kind of a micro sense, but I also like movement over the long term, you know. And one of the, 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 the coolest ways to do that, again, going back to the old Moog stuff, is to throw in a filter, okay. So let's do that, okay. Now, for this, I'm going to go to a different version of my RTC mix patch here. Okay, here we go. And now I have an RTC mix object where we're going to put all our drone stuff feeding into a second RTC mix. Okay, so this one has our drone stuff. Let's go ahead and load that drone stuff in. Okay, so I'll grab it here, open it up. So now I've got all the drony stuff there. We can check it by actually looking at this. But again, that's how tiny the font was, okay? But indeed, it has our, our full script there. Well, what are we going to put in here? This is where we're going to put our filter, okay? And the filter we're going to use is URTC Mix Docs, Instruments. Um, again, when I was a kid, I really wanted to have a Moog. I finally was able to afford a mini Moog, but the big modular Moogs, you know, they were like, you know, $10,000 and stuff, and I couldn't afford those. So now I have software, <laughs> and I can make my Moogs. In fact, look, there's a Moog filter right there. This is actually, it's the DSP equivalent of the Moog ladder filter, okay? And let me bring it in, okay? I'm just going to bring in this, okay? 
and let's go back to here, okay? And we'll call this now. Do you mean this uh, filter is kind of resembling the sound of the Moog, or is it actually a filter that was in the in, in Moog? Um, it's 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 the um, digital signal processing equivalent of the circuit for the Moog filter. Oh, okay. Okay. There's actually ways of realizing circuits as um, uh, DSP. Okay, that's how they theorize about them and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it's essentially the Moog filter. Okay. Yeah. And it said it's a low pass filter. Yeah, that's why I want to explain what it is. Okay. Um, <laughs> however, I want to be careful here because I don't want to um, lose this because we're going to be needing to load that into some other things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down here and I'm going to rename this. Okay. Here, I'm going to call this um, RTC Mix Drones text. Okay. All right. And here we're going to put in our stuff for the mode. Now I want to explain what these things are. Okay. And I'm going to do that. I'm going to bring up my little graphics program here and talk about the Moog filter a little bit. Okay. So we're going to create an image. All right. Okay. Create. All right. And let me grab my pencil -y thing here. Okay. Now this here is say frequency. Okay. And we're going to start out with the frequency at say maybe we'll say 20 hertz here and 20,000 hertz here. Okay, if you're first born, that's probably what you can hear. Okay, uh, realistically, we can't hear much. I can probably not hear much more about 11 or 12k. You're going, oh my god, you're missing half your hearing. Remember, this is a logarithmic scale. So from 10k to 20k is just the very uppermost octave. All right. And in fact, where we're going to be working a lot, um, one of the things to keep in mind as a reference is middle C is about 250 hertz. Okay. It's actually, I think it's like 261.2 or something like that, but 250 makes the math a little bit easier. That means an octave above middle C is 512. Two octaves is um, uh, not 512, 500. Five. Oh, shoot, I screwed it up. 500. Uh, two octaves above middle C is then 1,000. Three octaves is 2,000. Four octaves is 4,000. So you see very quickly you get jumping up here, okay? Now, so this is all the range of frequencies we've got. What a low pass filter does is exactly what you might think. It goes up to a certain value and that's called the, uh, the, the center frequency for some reason of the filter. Um, is that what they call it? In this, let me check my, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't say, okay. Um, and then it rolls off and stops frequency above it. High pass does the opposite. A band pass just passes a band of, of filters, okay. Now, this steepness, you can determine in some of the filters that we have, like the biquad filter uh, instrument and some of the others, you can determine whether that's going to go like that or whether it's going to like come down really sharply. The Moog has a very particular steepness. It, it, it decays 24 decibels per octave. So I've drawn it a little bit steeper than it actually is probably. But the other thing that's, that's interesting about the design of the Moog low pass filter is that right at the point where it rolls off, it has a little bump where it emphasizes those frequencies. That's called the resonation. Uh, it's called the, the, uh, the resonance of the filter. Yeah, couldn't think of the word, okay? And you can control how much of that is in your filter. You can set the resonance very high and you'll get it to the point where it will even start making a whistly sound because it will self-oscillate. And you hear that in Moog's, you know, Moog music, you hear like that. That's this resonant peak. And in fact, that resin table thing here, that's how we control that. Okay. So let's just go ahead and kind of set this up. All right. Um, get rid of that. And let's look at our thing here. Okay. So we've got our sound coming in. Okay. The first thing we need to do is say, oh, for this second RTC Mix ob object, you're going to be taking an input. Okay. And it's going to be coming in from audio. Now, 
you'll remember we have done these things where we sent the sound from one instrument in RTC mix to another using that bus config stuff. Okay. This is a way of doing it without using bus config. Um, and I wanted to keep the script separate for this class. You can also do this in Unity. Basically, you can set up separate scripts and the script from here can send sound to the script from here as long as you have this RT input object. They'd be separate like um, components on an object that you're building in Unity, but you don't have to use bus config. Later on, we're gonna be using bus config for some stuff, but I'm gonna do it like this for now, okay? So it's taking audio coming in, all right? What are we gonna do with it? Well, we're gonna run it through a Moog filter, okay? So our center frequency, we're gonna say, we'll say 700 Hertz, okay? So a little bit above, um, uh, about half, an octave and a half above middle C, okay? And then we'll set the resin to be equal to 0 0.5. If you set it to one, that's when you'll get the whistly stuff, okay? And we're gonna fool around with this so you can hear the difference in a little bit, okay? And now let's fill out our thing. Well, out skip. We're gonna start at zero, in skip. We're gonna start reading at zero because it's coming in directly. Uh, duration, we just want it to go forever um, because, you know, we're gonna be going forever. Uh, amplitude, this again is not the 10,000 of a synthesis. This is a multiplier. We want it to be the same amplitude going out as coming in. Input channel, well, we can choose to process either channel zero or channel one. We're going to assume process channel zero um, because this guy is basically um, the same. Uh, we just send it out to 0 0.5, so it's going out both channels with no problems. Okay. Pan, let's say 0 0.5. Bypass, this is just include because this is a feature of the old Moog filters. If I set this to one, it disables the filter. Obviously, I want to use the filter, so I'm going to set it to, to zero. Now, filter frequency table and filter resin table. That allows you, and we're going to use it in a little bit, to use make table or something like make table to control that frequency so we can actually move it over the course of the note, or we can control the resin. This is like taking the knobs on the old Mogan and, and like twisting them. But I just want a single value here. I can just say freak and resin, and it will just stay at those values, okay? So let's save this. Now we're gonna load it into this guy. Okay, so now we've got our drones being made there. We've got our filter being filtering here, okay? So life should be cool, okay? Let's turn on, oh shoot, I clicked too many times. Sorry about that. Let's turn on our DSP, and what you should hear is a filtered low pass, uh, low pass filtered uh, sawtooth wave, okay? And you didn't hear a thing, did you? Why not? Like I said, I've got these pre-made, so if worse comes to worse, I'll just go and grab that. Um, uh, I have a question in the meantime. Sure, sure. <laughs> Fire away. Um, what would happen if one, uh, both objects were going into the AC instead of... Um, because you said this RT input uh, actually sends the sound but they still have to be connected. So the filter has to go first and it has to modify the sound. Right. The, this, this is generating, this is generating the drones. Okay. I'm going to oh, just first double. Is the drone yeah. And, uh, yeah. That's why, that's why it wasn't making any sounds. I inadvertently loaded the filter into that one. Okay. okay. So this is generating the drones. There's, I don't know if you can see it. It's really tiny, but that's where our wavetable stuff is, okay? So that's sending the output of the drones into this one, which has an RT input audio, which means, oh, I'm gonna get my audio from there, and then I'm gonna run it through the Moog low pass filter. Now, you can, um, Nina, you can actually connect this directly to the DAC too, if you want to. If you did that, you would hear a mixture of the original sound with the filtered sound, okay? In fact, I think we're gonna use that later in, uh, in something we're gonna try, okay? Um, but this time, I just wanna hear the completely filtered version of those sawtooth waveforms, because they were kind of annoying. So I'm gonna turn this on. Now we should hear.
Okay, cool. All right. Now we're going to take that. The, the other fun thing to do with the Moog filter, though, is to move, like I said, those uh, frequencies and that, that uh, resonance stuff. So I'm going to bring up a different PD patch now that I pre-made. Here we go. All right. Boom. And now look what happened. I've got a slider that goes from 200 up to 2000. Same setup here. This we're going to load in our drone making stuff, which I happily renamed RTC Mix Drone, so we still have it. Okay. All right. And then you see this message down here it says callback error. I have no idea why that occurs. It doesn't affect anything. Okay. Something is, is kind of bizarre, and I'm not going to chase it down right now. All right. So let's go ahead and load in our original um, Moog VCF stuff. Okay. All right. And let's get our text edit up with that. All right. And here's what we're going to change. Okay. Rather than just setting the frequency here, we're going to set our frequency is going to be equal to make connection with zero. And we'll initially set it to be, say, 200 hertz. Okay. What's going to happen here? All right. Well, this is going to be kind of fun. Rather than the frequency being a single value, the frequency is going to look at that first inlet. So that means it's going to be looking for its frequency value here. So we're going to be able to change that frequency over the course of time. Well, let's do it. Okay. First of all, let's reload our file that we just modified. Oh, the DSP is still on. So we can just hit our go. Okay. So that's the fun of a filter that has moving stuff. Okay. Now, just for fun to show you, I never set up a slider on this, but here's what happens if I change the resonant to say 0 0.9. Okay. Remember I said that was from 0, 0.0 to 0 0.1. If I did that, now I reload that um, stuff here. Now if I play it, you can hear that resonant peak. You know, it has that, that much sharper kind of like nasally sound to it. You know, that's kind of what that guy does. Okay, let me put that back to five. All right, now this is all well and good, and it's starting to sound even cooler. Okay, don't worry. We got a lot of cool stuff to show you guys tonight. Uh, however, Brad, yes, fire away. Sorry, just a quick question. If you aren't over this already, I apologize. But if we're saving and recording this as a um, WAV or MP3, uh, how would we do that in PD? Uh, I think that what you're going to do. Um, you know what? I'm going to have to look that up. There's a way with PD, there's yeah. a way that you can, uh, hmm. Yeah. I, I'd have to look that up, but there's a way you can record it. Okay. There's definitely a way you can record your PD stuff. I mean, one way would be to use a Soundflower or Jack and, uh, have that go into a file and then you can change it to an MP3 after that. There's actually, we're going to be talking a little bit about, um, black hole potentially too so you can record your own sound yeah 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 that would work that should work okay um obviously there's ways because people use pd to render stuff all the time i just don't know what it is offhand okay um yeah i'll tell you what i'll look that up and i'll make sure and put it on the web page too okay uh, i just saw a hand raise too uh, i think reina you had your hand up oh yeah i have a question about the when you a little bit earlier in the drone when you mul did multiple um, like wave yes. table calls, mm -hmm. would you ever have a like an issue with the audio like peaking or does it automatically sort of ha. crush everything? Down? Good point. Very good point. Okay. In fact, let me show you something very clever that I did kind of um, on the sly here. Okay. Hold on. I uh, I originally set this at twenty thousand. Remember full frequency was actually 32768. So typically I set this to 30,000. 
I set it to 20,000, which reduced the, uh, the maximum output of all of these slightly. Now that's running a little bit close to the bone there because um, what you're counting on is that their phases are all gonna be different and they're gonna be adding and subtracting from each other as they're mixed together. So I've just discovered in the past that I, if I use three wave tables, 20,000 seems to be okay. But a lot of times I'll even take it down to 10,000 or something. You're gonna see that when we do some granular stuff later on too. Um, but you're right, if you exceed that 32768, you will get distortion and you'll hear it. It'll go <sighs> kind of like that. You go, oh, it's too loud. And then you can go back and change the amplitude. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, hey, guys, don't apologize for asking questions. You know, this that's actually a good thing. First of all, it makes me feel like I'm actually talking to human beings, <laughs> which is a nice thing. Um, and secondly, you know, uh, it, you know, it helps, you know, a lot of times other people are going to have the same questions. I'm just kind of flying along. And if you something isn't clear, you know, be sure to ask me about it, you know, or if something you want to ask about something that's related to what we're doing, you know, be sure to ask about it too. Yeah, okay. yeah actually, Alessandro dropped a really good uh, tutorial. Um, there's a forum on PD, so. Yeah. Oh, in the, uh, in, the, in the chat? Yeah, I can't see the chat. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's always fun to read through the chat when class is over going, oh, wow, they were really having a good time out there. <laughs> All right, so here's the dilemma. We're doing cool stuff, but we have to move this by hand. How can we get that to move on its own? Well, I'm gonna show you different ways of doing that. I think three, no, just two different ways, two different ways, okay? Um, but there's many ways to do this, okay? So we're gonna go now to, let's see, which one do I wanna go to? I think back to RTC Mix 2 because we're not going to be using the slider any longer. So let me bring that guy up. Okay, but we're still going to be using um, the other stuff, that, that kind of basic structure. Okay, so let's load in our drones. Okay, all right, and then let's go ahead and load in what we've done so far with the um, uh, filters. Okay, so let's. Um, we're looking at this RTC mix stuff. All right, we're not gonna do this, okay? We're gonna have a different way of setting the frequency, all right? And the way that we're gonna do, okay, is that there's a bunch of other stuff in the RTC mix scripting language, okay? Score file, all right? And the one that we're gonna look at first of all is something, again, borrowed from the good old analog days, make LFO. What's make LFO? Well, make LFO basically creates a low frequency oscillator, all right? These are control signals that typically are under the 20 Hertz, you know? And in fact, we're gonna use one very low, okay? We give it a waveform, interp type, we don't need to worry about a frequency and a minimum and a maximum amplitude for this, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say frequency equals make LFO, okay, and we're going to give it the waveform. We're just going to use a sine wave for this, okay, and we're going to give it a frequency. Let's make it be only 0 0.2 hertz, okay, so that means it'll take, uh, oh, let's make it be faster than that. Uh, Let's make it be a half a hertz, okay? So it'll cycle every two seconds, okay? All right, and then we're gonna give it a low value and a high value, and we already know we're gonna go from 200 up to 2000. So now this is not controlled by connection. It's gonna be controlled by this low frequency oscillator. that's just gonna sit there and oscillate, okay? And this is something that was used in the good old modes. Um, uh, and we're gonna turn this off, I think. Amp, min, mix, did I do everything? Yes, okay. So let me save that. Get rid of this, go back out to our max patch, our PD patch, load that in. And now I think we're still DSPing, so I can just start it. And we should hear now. Nice. 
And of course, we can make that be much faster if we want. Let's take it to be 10.5 hertz just for fun. This is the, the one thing to do is once you get something cool happening is start fooling around with some of the parameters, OK? And let's make the resin be, say, maybe 0.1 instead. So it's not going to be even as nasally as it was. Now we hear it. I'll be honest, I have no idea why it was sounding that way, but it sounded pretty cool. Um, anyhow, uh, so this is one way to do it, okay? Let's bring that back up to 0 05. But suppose I didn't want anything as regular as a low frequency oscillator. Well, there's another fun thing that you can use in our arsenal of RTC mix stuff, okay? It's called make random. Set up a periodic random number generator for control purposes. So you say make random type, then the frequency, and then, of course, the minimum and the maximum. And it's kind of like the way IRAND works, only it's now doing this thing. These are all the different types of distributions you can have, an even, a triangle, a Gaussian, a Cauchy, a probability, all kinds of fun things like that, okay? Let's just go ahead and put one in, okay? Let's try make random. We'll make it even, so it'll be like all over the place, okay? And let's give it a frequency. Let's say every one hertz. Let's say, no, we'll say two hertz, so like twice every second, okay? It'll like generate a new random number, okay? Minimum, again, 200. Maximum, 2,000. And let's, let's make it be a little bit more resonant -y so that we can hear it a little bit better, okay? Again, that's all we do to change it because now we're controlling our frequency with this make random and we'll hear some fun stuff with that. So let's load in our RTC mix stuff. DSP is still on, let's listen. That sounds really weird to me. I wonder what's going on. Um, Hmm. I don't have any other RTC mix things going. You know what? I'm going to restart PD at this point um, because uh, there's something that I don't like. Oh, let me try this. There we go. That's what it's supposed to sound like. Okay. I think there was a there was an old PD patch that was somehow being triggered, even though the um, the uh, window had had. Uh, shut off so that we were hearing basically two things at once okay but that's the randomness that you're hearing okay um and you know that's kind of cool but what if instead you wanted to have it kind of like drift from one of those random peaks from one to the other rather than jumping from one to the other well let's slow it down a little bit let's make it be only every half a hertz okay so that means it'll take it Every two seconds, it'll generate a new value. And we can actually hear how that's going to sound like this. Oops. i uh, got to reload that. Turn on my DSP. Let me put that down here. And now we'll hear it. Hey, if you guys are hearing some clicks in there, that's because of Zoom, OK? Uh, that's not anything happening with RTC Next or anything like that. It's just the, the nature of the internet and the happiness. All right, so we got this random thing happening, but we want it to be smoothly gliding from one random value to the next, okay? We're going to call this initial freak, okay? And we're going to put in something else here that freak is going to be equal to. What is that something else? Well, we have another happy RTC Mix thing called make filter. And look, you can clip things, you can constrain things, you can delay things, or you can smooth things. Apply a simple averaging filter to an incoming data stream. Well, that sure sounds like what we want to do, right? All right. So you give it your input P field. You say smooth. And then lag is a number between 0 and 100% as to how much it's going to like smooth it out. Okay. So here's what we do. Make filter. Uh, put in our input in it freak so it's taking the stuff coming from there plugging it into the filter here 
the filter it's going to plug into is, in fact, smooth. And let's do like a 90% smoothing, okay? Now let's hear what it sounds like. All right. So we're going to load up here our Cynic stuff, turn on our DSP, and here we go. Okay, cool. Uh, you know what? Let's make it longer. Let's make the drones last more. Okay, let me bring up the drones. Okay, and let's make them last for maybe 100 seconds. And that means they're going to fade in quite a bit here. Let's make this be 0 0.1 instead of that. Okay, and we can just leave the fade out there. Okay, so now let's save that. Okay, and let's go here and load in our new drones. I'm doing this for a reason too, okay? Because we're gonna do one more thing that's gonna be kind of fun. All right, uh, let's hear what that sounds like. Okay. okay. So it's gonna sit there and do that for a while. But you know what? I want even more stuff happening, okay? The filter is great, but first of all, it's in mono, and we're gonna be talking about stereo in just a second. Um, and I want it to be thicker still, all right? So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go out here, and I'm going to add something else to this. And this time I am gonna use bus config because I don't wanna go through the whole process of putting in a whole new RTC mix object or anything like that. And what I'm going to use is a delay object. It's one of my favorites in the world it's called pan echo. All right. So let's get this up here. Pan echo does that. And we're going to set it up bus config. Okay. Um, Moog VCF. And it's, we're just going to say that it's going to take only channel zero, because that's all we're really concerned about right now. We're just getting the, the single channel of drones coming out. So we're going to say in zero, and it's going to put it out on augs zero out. Okay. This is the syntax. I, I kind of showed you this. I didn't really explain it very well. Basically, this is a way of interconnecting the inputs and outputs. When it says in zero, it's going to be reading from this RT input audio. Now, when it says it's putting it out on aug zero out, that means that I can configure the next instrument in the chain, pan echo, to read the audio from augs zero in. And then it's going to put it out to out zero one because it has a stereo output. Because pan echo has two, count them, two different delays one for the left channel and one for the right channel, which is just more fun than words, all right? So after we do our Moog thing here, then we're gonna add in our pan echo thing, out skip of zero, in skip of zero, duration of 9999, amplitude we'll say one, okay? Channel zero delay, let's say a 10th of a second, okay? Channel one delay, we'll say maybe three tenths of a second. Well, actually, let's make this be three tenths of a second, and let's make this be four tenths of a second. Feedback, okay? Um, this is a value uh, between zero and one. If you make it one, it will never decay, and it will distort because it will just build up sound over and over. So let's do something reasonable. Let's say 0 0.7, okay? Basically, that's how much you attenuate the signal every time it comes back into the echo, because the echoes are going to echo over and over and over again. Ring down dur. If we had this with a note that was going to end, that would matter. This is going on forever, so we'll just say zero. And our input channel, it defaults to zero, but I'll put in zero anyhow, okay? So now we're going to load that thing in to where we had our just plain Moog filter. And now we're going to hear the Moog filter run through the pan echo. And it's going to sound like this.
and I could listen to that for a long time. Like I said, I'm a drony kind of guy, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, what we had started out with a simple, basic, annoying sawtooth wave drone has turned into this really amazing kind of, whoa. yeah, that's what I like about sound. <laughs> hey, I'm a, I'm a child of the 1970s. Actually, I'm a child of the 50s, but uh, I did a lot of work in the studios in the 70s and we used echoes a lot. <laughs> you know, there's right. a glitching effect, but I was probably Zoom. <laughs> What's that? There was this glitchy effect, like, -dum, like, <laughs> like one sound that like um, rhythmicize, like yeah. an theater thing. It was Zoom. Yes, it was Zoom. Uh, but yeah. uh, maybe, maybe that'd be fun to duplicate it somehow. That'll be a challenge. Yeah, it was, it was nice. <laughs> yeah, very nice sound. See, you're you're younger than I. You go for that glitchy stuff, Nina. Uh. <laughs> No, no, no. Definitely, yes. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. Fun times. All right. Let's, uh, let's now switch gears. And I want to talk about stereo a little bit. Okay. Um, and I'm going to take us back to uh, a thing that we did for one of our Zoom, uh, one of our uh, Unity projects when we made the volcano and we had this ambient noise. Let me close this guy off. Okay. And I'm going to bring up plain one again okay can we add that to that unity project like some of those sounds oh like, definitely yeah again all the patches all the the scripts are going to be there just run them in that scoralizer and just bring them on into unity and they should work yeah uh yeah definitely you can you can have that stuff you know that's that's the whole point of it so yeah you can even take the drone down to like 30 hertz or 20 hertz. If you've got subwoofers, it's really cool. Okay. All right. So here's what we're going to do. Okay. We're going to get rid of all this nonsense now and see if this looks familiar. Okay. I did this thing and I'm going to explain what, more about what it is. Okay. Uh, let's see. 251. Then I did um, II noise. Zero. I will just say 10 for now, 20, 1, 2, 3, 0 0.5, okay? We made this kind of weird, kind of windy-like noise below that was kind of like the ambient noise. Obviously, it was going longer than 10 seconds. It was going for a long time, okay? That's basically start, duration, amplitude, and um, uh, stereo. Zero is left, one is right. This thing up here, this setup, this tells you the kind of filter that you're going to apply to this noise. This II stands for IIR. It's a particular kind of filter called an infinite impulse response filter. Again, we're not gonna, oh, my cat's down here yelling at me. No, no, don't bite me. Stay away. But it's amazing that the cat always comes around the same time. <laughs> it's getting, it, well, it wants its food. Yeah. You know, it's like an hour before it's gonna get any food, but it just tries to push the envelope, you know? <laughs> yeah. But the internal clock is there. Yes. Can you guys hear it? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Go away, cat. <laughs> okay. Anyhow, it'll, it'll, it'll try to bite me in a little bit and I'll have to chase it with a pillow. So be prepared. All right. Um, so basically, what the way this works is that this gives you the center frequency and this gives you how big the band is in that frequency. So if I bring up this like little converter thing again, this, uh, this nonsense here, okay, and let me uh, get rid of all this, okay. Um, basically, this filter looks like this. It's a bandpass filter, where that's the center frequency, and then you've got a bandwidth here, okay. So this has got a bandwidth of 50 hertz on either side of 200 hertz. So that makes kind of like this weird little windy sound, okay. And here's what it sounded like in the, in the, um, in the actual um, application that we made. So let me load that up. Okay, turn on our DSP and it sounded like this. Okay, and again, we, we turned it down so it was kind of subtle and low and I didn't do any fanciness of moving the filter around or anything like that. I just wanted kind of like an ambient sound. But you know what? There's something I, I didn't want to get into it uh, because the point of that was to show you how to use the train editor and all that stuff. But we can make this sound a lot better very easily by using stereo. Notice that when I did the pan echo, 
with the left and the right. I'm a big person for designing for the fact that you've generally got two sources in, um, in, in your, in your um, sort of playback system, you know, Unity set up for stereo and things like that. And I want to give you an example of sort of how, yeah, let me just do it first of all with this, okay? What I'm going to do is send that to the left channel. I'm going to make another one and send it to the right channel. I'm going to turn it down a little bit too because it was a little bit loud for me, okay? So I've got two of these going at the same time. Now, because they're both generating noise, the noise is going to be different from each other because noise is random stuff. So they're not duplicating. They're actually two separate things. And this makes a huge difference in how it sounds, you know, especially if you've got headphones on or through decent speakers or anything, okay? So let me go here, reload that. And now, listen to the difference. It just makes it kind of come alive more, you know? And I've got, I'm, like I said, I'm going to play some, some songs, some music. I want to play you some stuff that makes use because this this idea of using the stereo spread like that is ubiquitous in most modern contemporary pop music and things like that. And I've got this song that I want to play. Um, I use this in my production class that I teach to undergraduates that shows exactly this is basically we're calling it double tracking. What happens when you can do this? It's a it's an Irish folk musician named Patrick Kilbride that I quite like. And it's a straight ahead thing with like a goofy harp in the background. And then you're going to hear this really cheesy string synthesizer come in. But it starts out like this. So it's pretty straight ahead. You know, the guy's a fabulous guitarist, okay? But I want you to hear, it's, this is a medley, and when he goes from the first song, which is um, Rakish Patty, to, um, to um, uh, the first song is Rodney's Glory, to the second one, Rakish Patty, um, he does this thing with double tracking that's just amazing, okay? Here we go. Let me run it to about here. Okay, so see if you can tell when he double tracks his guitar. <laughs> it just completely widens out the stereo spectrum you know basically he's playing the same thing he's so good he can play the same thing twice you know and he's got basically two patrick kilbrides going one hard left and one hard right and you get that giant stereo spread you know i just i just eat that stuff up uh, there's a funny story. When I first heard this, um, I was driving back from Columbia. This is before um, I actually had a place in New York City. We were living in central New Jersey. And I used to listen to a show on WNYC called New Sounds. It was always played at about 11 p.m., which is when I would be driving home. And John Schaefer happened to play this. It's the first time I'd heard it. And <laughs> There's a point when you go across the GW Bridge where you kind of come out of Fort Lee and you're kind of up above and you kind of see this view. That's exactly when that part of this music happened. So I'm driving along and it, this wonderful stereo guitars start coming out of my headphones. And I look out and I go, oh, New Jersey. <laughs> it was just, oh, quite, quite fun. <laughs> Anyhow. Yeah. You know what? Trying to tell jokes on Zoom is just an exercise in utter futility because I have no idea what you guys thought of that. Sorry. Uh, one of my one of my perks as professors, I get to tell like goofy stories. Okay. Hey, so here's what we're going to do. All right. We're going to actually try and recreate a guitar strum that double tracks because that's also another way of showing you some things about RTC mix I want to show you and especially that use of constrained randomness okay um how are we doing on time yeah we're definitely going to run out of time um, I'm going to give you a little taste of some stuff that's ahead um towards the end of the class um 
Uh, let's get rid of all of this, okay? And we've got the right RTC Mix PD version up here. And the first thing I'm going to do is set up a a a um, uh, a guitar simulation. We have a very good instrument for doing that. It's a physical model that you've seen me use before called Strum Two, which uh, which uses that Carpless Strong algorithm um, and makes a very, very, a fairly realistic kind of pluck string sound, okay? Here's what we're gonna do though, okay? We're gonna say pitches equals, okay? 7 .00, 7.00, 7.07, 8.00, 8.02, 8.05, and 8.10, all right. What are these numbers, okay? This is an array, okay? And we're gonna to refer to it as pitches sub zero, pitches sub one, pitches sub two. These numbers are a way of specifying, I think I've mentioned this before, but I'm gonna mention it strongly here, um, notes on the keyboard, okay? Uh, it's called octave point pitch class. You'll see this in a lot of documentation. Um, 8.00 is middle C, that's octave eight. 8.02 is two semitones above middle C, so that's a D above middle C. 7.00 is one octave below middle C. 7.07 .07 is the G that's just below middle C. See how it works? Eight point, and I could actually write 8.12 if I wanted, that would be equivalent to writing 9.00 there, okay? And the cool thing is you're not limited to just um, equal tempered. I could put in that if I wanted to and actually hit that note. So Georg Haas, Georg Haas doesn't have to yell at me about this, but I just want a regular old piano strum notes of these things, okay? So I need to know what the length of that array is for how I'm gonna set this up, okay? So I'll say L pitches equals len. Len is an RTC mix function built in that will tell me that that's actually one, two, three, four, five, elements long, six elements long, sorry. So that's stored. And here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna say amp equals 5,000. Um, yeah, uh, Reina, here's where I'm pulling the amp down because these are all gonna stack on top of each other, okay? And uh, I happen to know ahead of time it would have distorted if I kept it as loud as it was, okay? I'm gonna say start equals zero. And I'm gonna say this, for i equals zero, i is less than l pitches, or the length of that pitches array, I, and I'll just say plus equals one, because we already know about that, okay? And here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna say pitch equals pitches sub I. And then we're gonna say basically strum two, and we're gonna fill out, out skip, start, dur, um, I think I just said seven there, seven seconds long. Amp is gonna be amp. Pitch is now going to be pitch. Squish, again, this is a value from zero to 10. How sharp is the implement you're picking? We're gonna use a fairly stiff pick. The gay time is also seven. And our output pan, we're just gonna say is 0 0.5. We're gonna put it right in the middle again, all right? And then we're gonna to listen to this, okay? All right. So basically what this is gonna do is go through that array one element at a time, starting with element zero, then element one, then element two, element three, etc. And it's going to put that in for the pitch value and generate this sort of stacked chord. Well, let's hear what it sounds like. Okay. Let's load in rtcmixstuff.txt, turn on our DSP, and we'll hear a nice chord. Now, Notice that it sounds a little bit different timbrely each time. That's a feature of the physical model that's really nice um, because it generates, it, it's mimicking the physics of an actual plucked string. And each time you hit the string, it's gonna be a slightly different state, okay? However, it doesn't sound like a guitar at all because guitarists do not play all the strings exactly at the same time. You know, these are all playing at time zero. So that's like a guitarist that has, you know, six fingers just going, bang, you know, and making sure they all hit. So how do we model that so that it actually does a little bit better job, okay? 
Well, we're going to introduce another variable up here that we're going to call note del. Okay. And we're going to set that equal to 0 0.02. What we're going to do here is in our loop, we're going to say start plus equals del. So every time we play a note, we're going to add two hundredths of a second before it plays the next note. Okay. That should then sort of stretch out and allow for the actual physical time it takes to get from one note to the other when you're strumming a guitar. So let's open that up. And now we get this. So sounds a little strummier, you know, but it's still a little bit weird because you don't know it, but it's actually your ear can determine that this is a fixed value. It sounds very artificial to us, okay? We're gonna change note del to max note del, and we're gonna make it a little bit bigger, okay? So basically, instead of saying start plus equals note del, we're gonna say start plus equals irand zero max note del. So what that's gonna do is again, constrained randomness, it's going to insert a slightly random value for each note that it plays. So now you're, you're kind of accommodating the fact that you can't strum exactly precisely, and you'll get something that sounds more like this. Which if you listen to it a whole lot like I do, it starts sounding a little bit more realistic. There's a lot more you can do in terms of also altering the pitches slightly, you know, with some random values. But we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna leave that, and instead we're gonna do the Patrick Kilbride thing, and we're gonna make this be stereo. And we're gonna do that by simply taking that, making all of that go to channel zero, and just copy pasting it, making all that go to channel one. So we basically got two guitars strumming here. Okay, each one with a slight amount of randomness on the de note delays. And now when we load that guy up, here's what we get. We get this. Which is not too bad, okay? Um, now, there's actually a way that you can duplicate this in a, in a sense in a studio without having the double tracking happening. And it's a slightly different effect. And so people tend to use it for that reason, okay? And it's instead of double tracking, you can take one guitar and introduce a fixed delay time. Um, generally, a lot of times this is called a slap back delay or something like that. And um, you, can, you can get, basically, you, you start with the, with the thing in one channel, and then you get the delayed signal occurring in another channel. And I tell you what, um, rather than typing all this in, I'm going to just kind of load in some of the ones that I kind of pre-did here, okay, to show you how that works, okay? And uh, let me see here. Let's go to, we're going to need rtcmix2.pd for this. Okay, and I'm going to do it from here because that's where I've got these things. Okay, and I'll show you what the scripts look like. Okay, all right, let me load in first of all our strum stuff, which was uh, strum three, I believe. Yeah. Okay, and let's load in our del1.txt, okay? All right, now, what do these guys look like? Okay, here's strum three. Strum three you've already seen. It's just the basic strum stuff. The one that's new is this one, okay? Okay, I'm using an RT Sigmax instrument called delay one. And what it does is it inserts a particular delay. It plays the original signal through the left channel. Then it plays a delayed signal through the right channel. 
So you get that kind of like effect of left and right like that. And they're delayed by delay time, which I'm setting pretty short here, 0 0.07, okay? And again, this is set up so it's reading the audio coming in. So here comes our strums. There they are there, okay? They're going into this delay thing, and then the left channel will be the original signal. The right channel will be the delayed signal. And here's what it sounds like. Right. So now I did one thing wrong. Notice that it got louder and louder every time I hit that. It's because I was re-triggering the delay too. Basically, I should only trigger that once because it should just sit there and continue to delay. It was basically adding more and more delays to it. Um, I'll fix that before I put it on the web, okay? Um, and again, this is something that a lot of people use. Um, uh, this guy uses it a lot. favorite guitarist Jeff Beck and that's just filled with double tracked and delayed guitars of all stripe you know constantly keeping the stereo image just sort of in motion and again that's the kind of stuff that you know makes sound really come alive for me okay all righty uh, yes um do you think it was also the effect was used on the uh bass frequencies like on bass in general or mostly guitar like um, how much can you use it until it gets overwhelming? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's up to you to use your ears. Um, mm -hmm. I think I think a lot of times bass they don't do so much delays on because your ear decodes um, positional information differently for frequencies as they get lower. It relies mm -hmm. more on amplitude rather than delays. It's the higher frequency that use delays. Oh no no wait I think I told that backwards. Uh, you mean uh, uh, stereo? Yeah, onset like delays. On, yeah, yeah. You're, you're, you're basically the onset delays. You're, you're getting really interesting information to your cognitive apparatus um, when you delay the signal from one ear to the other, because your 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 brain uses those delays from hitting this side of the head to the other. Well, it's when I was talking about the localized instrument. Yeah. You know? And by introducing delays artificially into the music that you're producing, you're creating these weird and interesting kind of super images of where the mm -hmm. sound might be coming from. Now, when you get down in bass frequencies, you don't use delays because the waveform is too big. You use amplitude instead. And in fact, a lot of times you can't tell where a bass is coming from. That's why you have a single subwoofer in a lot of uh, studio setups because you can't mm -hmm. really differentiate. It just sits there and it goes, I'm making bass, you know. Um, what you can do is you can take the bass sound and spread it like, one of the things I didn't do with that original drone stuff is that I had them all coming out of one channel. I could have split it up to have them come out of multiple channels and you would have gotten a sense of a larger drone field. You know, these are all things that you can kind of play with and kind of, you know, use to carve at the sound and make it sound better. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, we're running out of time. I've got, I want to talk about reverb and I'm going to talk about filtering a little bit and then talk about um, vocal processing, okay? And let me just give you a little hint of the fun that's ahead, okay? Let's, uh, I'll go back to here and see, I recorded some sounds, okay? This is me, okay, saying this. Hi, this is Brad, and I'm recording this as a demo for my graduate class. Okay. Um, one of the things that we're going to look at is how you can take that apart and do some really interesting things in terms of resynthesizing voice. Um, this is a big area of, of work um, in a lot of music right now, uh, pop music, I should say, uh, not being pejorative or anything. 
because I like that stuff. Um, but here's one of the things that we can do, okay? Okay, let's load in this one. Okay, and here's the version that I was going to play for you. <laughs> Okay, so basically, I'm not doing a vocoder. I'm actually resynthesizing the voice, and you can actually go in and specify exactly how you want to resynthesize, and come up with all kinds of like really cool effects as a result. Um, so we'll be talking about some of that. The reverb stuff is a lot of fun, um, but do we have exactly four minutes left in the class? So let me stop my share. And how was that? Was that okay, you guys? I think it was kind of fun. Um, I hope it was instructive for some of you. Um, you know, maybe it'll be useful. Like I said, we wanted to also talk about sound in this class. <laughs> because it's kind of what we do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Alrighty. Um, I will go ahead and put a lot of this stuff um, uh, online and you'll get my email and uh, yeah, Brad's cat always starts crying around the same time, I know. <laughs> oh, Lordy. Oh, yeah, Alessandra. Yeah, this was total review for you. Uh, we have actually kind of a, a, a famous production person here. Alessandra Urso is actually kind of out in the city doing that kind of work, so she knows all these fun tricks. In fact, one of the things I was going to mention is that, you know, these are kind of standalone, simple little things that you can do with your sound if you want to, like, use interactive sound. But if you want to just go ahead and create some, like, cool sounds, um, you know, fire up Logic or Reaper or something and use some of the plugins because they're much more sophisticated than just these kind of basic. They're often combinations of these things. You can also use things like the VST um, tilde object inside Max MSP, and there's a VST synth, I think, inside them. Um, no, VST plugin tilde in PD. And you can access a lot of these much more sophisticated, you know, sets of signal processing um, algorithms and use it to kind of render sound and stuff. And I will look up and post how you render sound from PD onto your disk so that you can pre-create the sound files and then use them. That's that's one of the easiest ways to get a cool sound in your project. Okay. All righty. Uh, any questions or comments about this? Yeah. Okay. I will definitely uh, put this online because I think a fair number of people were not able to make it today. Um, and again, remember, no class next week. And the following week, uh, Nina will be doing some fun stuff. And again, you know, come prepared to talk about projects. Again, I'll put that out in the email too. All right, let me shut off the recording now. <laughs>